Good evening. I'm Kathy Eckler, the outgoing president of the ACLU board. Welcome to the 2023 annual meeting of the ACLU of Delaware. Thank you for taking your time this evening to join us and to hear what we've been up to since the last time we met. This is your chance to get a look at what our fabulous staff is working on now and for the next year. I'm calling this meeting to order formally. I'm turning this over to Mike Brickner, our wonderful executive director, who will give you an overview of the meeting and keep our agenda moving. Over to you, Mike. All right, thank you so much, Kathy. As she said, my name is Mike Brickner. I use he, him pronouns, and I am executive director with the ACLU of Delaware. And I am so excited for all of you to be here with us tonight to hear about the great work that the ACLU of Delaware is doing, the great work that is happening here in Delaware, and uh, you know what we have in, in store for the future. Um, we do have some housekeeping things to start off with. So if you are here on Zoom with us, uh, please go into the chat, chat with us. We'll be putting in links uh, to keep you engaged during this uh, hour or so long meeting. Uh, if you are tuning in via Facebook, we're also there on Facebook Live with you, and you can uh, watch us there, interact with us, comment, like, share uh, the post while you're there. Um, you know, some of the things that you could expect tonight, we're going to be hearing from some of our board leaders. You're going to learn a little bit more about our finances. You're going to hear a bit about uh, some of our outgoing board members, some of our new officers who are going to be taking uh, a role in the organization, and some of the new board members that are going to be joining us uh, very soon. So we're very excited about all of those things. We're also really excited for you to hear a bit more about the work that is going on at the ACLU of Delaware. And we're going to be spotlighting uh, some of our campaigns. So you're going to be hearing about our work on reproductive rights. You're going to be hearing about the amazing uh, work that's been ongoing for now three years to get right to representation and evictions. You're going to be hearing the latest with our Smart Justice campaign. Uh, and you're also going to be uh, uh, hearing just a bit more about our work overall uh, with uh, advocacy uh, within our organization. Um, I do want to make uh, a, a minute, uh, take a minute to just note uh, a couple of uh, uh, sad things here tonight. So first of all, I just want to take a moment to recognize that this is the three-year anniversary uh, of the murder of George Floyd and how much further we have to go uh, here in the state to uh, uh, realize true police reform. Uh, the ACLU of Delaware uh, has been committed for a number of years to achieving real police reform in the state of Delaware. We have been major proponents of uh, reforms to the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. And you know, three years since the murder of George Floyd, we have to recognize uh, how much further we really have to go. Um, another bit of sad news here tonight, uh, we were just infer informed a little bit earlier today uh, that one of our founders of the ACLU of Delaware, uh, Gil Sloan, uh, passed away. Uh, I'm very sad uh, about this loss of uh, Gil Sloan. Uh, and of course, our thoughts are with his sons, Jonathan and Victor. Of course, he was the spouse of Sonia Sloan, who I think many folks in Delaware know. Uh, but Gil was an amazing person. Um, when I moved here three years ago, he reached out uh, immediately, and we actually had lunch uh, down at the riverfront. Uh, Gil was so warm and welcoming, uh, gave me a lot of information about the ACLU and about Delaware, uh, and he kept uh, emailing and calling me. Uh, he came to an open house that we had at the ACLU of Delaware last year, where we showed off our new uh, uh, renovated spaces. We uh, opened up our new uh, online archives and he was uh, able to get up, speak and tell a few stories from the old days at the ACLU of Delaware. Uh, some of the work that they did when they founded the uh, affiliate over 60 years ago and was able to answer questions and connect with new advocates and activists. And so, um, very sad to lose uh, Gil. Um, again, our thoughts are with his family, um, and I'm very sorry to have to kick off the annual meeting with some uh, rather somber news. Um, but with that, 
uh, again, I'm very happy to uh, turn this over to some of our board leadership. We have an amazing uh, board treasurer, Tom O'Brien, uh, who has you know, volunteered his time for a number of years with us to make sure all of our financials are in order to make sure that we are a strong and healthy affiliate, able to move forward and do the important work that we do. So uh, Tom is going to take a few minutes to uh, give you an overview of how we're doing as an affiliate uh, and where we are financially. Tom? Thank you, Mike, and thanks everyone for attending tonight. Um, like any good uh, financial treasury guy, I do have a slide or two. So if we could pull up one of those. Um, if not, I will just speak to it. Oh, here we come. So uh, I, I'm here uh, on behalf of the Finance Committee, which, as Mike uh, rightly says, is a group of volunteers uh, who really look after your donations to the chapter and make sure that we are confident that we're investing it well. Um, in social justice initiatives in Jel Delaware. Um, I'm happy to report to you that thanks to your generosity, the state of the chapter is very strong. Uh, that kind of green bar there is the takeaway point of the slide. That's our net assets position or equity position. And in, as you can see, it's just a bit over two and a half million dollars, um, which is about as high as it's been. Um, the um, why that's important is that it allows us to invest in a lot of the work you're going to hear about over the next hour. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, what that means for us as a finance committee and as a board is that we can continue to increase our financial investment. And that's the kind of that red line on that chart is how much are we investing year over year in social justice initiatives of the money that you trust us with. And that has really been spectacular growth over the past several years. We've been able to increase our investment in Delaware um, by over 80%, if you look at that expense line, from over a million, about a million dollars in 2020 uh, to a budget position of 1.9 million. Um, that's fantastic because we feel that, as you will, hopefully when you hear all the great things that are happening, um, that now is the time. Now is the time to make a difference in Delaware. Um, and that increasing expense is an expression, I think, of the board's confidence in the soundness of the work that's being done uh, that you're going to hear about, and also our confidence in you, that you'll continue to be there for us, that we can continue to grow and invest, because we know you'll be as excited about these programs as we are. Um, so, so with that, I'll turn it back to Mike for the rest of the program. Thanks, Tom. And I always feel uh, very secure having Tom as our treasurer. Against, again, he does such a great job of making sure that we are uh, honoring the work and honoring the investment that every donor with the ACLU makes uh, to our organization. So again, uh, I want to encourage folks, uh, if you are inspired by the work that we're doing tonight, there will be links to uh, donate to us. Um, you know, again, we're only able to do the work that we're able to do because of uh, contributions from folks like you. Um, one thing that we have been able to do, um, especially in the past year, is respond to emergencies. And one real emergency in this country has been the state of reproductive rights. Uh, since the Dobbs decision uh, in the Supreme Court, um, uh, abortion rights have been under attack like never before. And yes, we do live in a state here in Delaware where we do have protections. But we also know that those protections are not guaranteed when we have uh, other states that are banning and criminalizing abortion care, when we have a US Supreme Court uh, that has been so aggressive towards reproductive rights, and we have opponents of abortion who will stop at nothing until it is banned across the country. And so it is even more important for us here in the state of Delaware to respond and to make sure that they are protected and that the right to get an abortion is accessible to everybody. Um, so we've been able to uh, respond in that moment and take on this issue that you know, was not necessarily a top tier priority of ours uh, two years ago to really becoming uh, a, a huge priority. And we were able to expand our staff uh, this year. And I'm really excited to say that we have uh, Helen Salida, who is our new campaign manager, our very first uh, staff person who's been uh, based in the southern part of the state in lovely Georgetown, Delaware. Uh, we were so lucky, lucky to have uh, Helen on staff, and you'll get to hear some of the amazing work that she's been doing on reproductive rights. Uh, Helen? 
Hi, thanks for that welcome, Mike. Um, and I'm excited to get to talk to everyone for just a couple minutes about some of the great reproductive freedom work that we've been doing here um, so far this year. Um, so like Mike said, you know, we're, we're really invested in making sure um, that not only is, uh, you know, Delaware has the right to an abortion protected, but we want to make sure that everyone actually has access to that fundamental right. So one of our largest priorities this year has been the passage of a Medicaid funded um, abortion bill. And we were, are so excited that HB 110 has been introduced in the House. This bill requires most insurance providers, including Medicaid, uh, to cover the cost of an abortion. Now, for too many here in Delaware, cost simply just makes care inaccessible. And we know that when a person who wants an abortion um, is denied that, they're more likely to fall into poverty than someone who's able to get an abortion. And so abortion restrictions, they really harm the most vulnerable groups, uh, people who are already, you know, um, in kind of precarious situations. For too many, this means that they are having to think about shifting funds from necessities like food or rent or childcare, or simply not being able to access the care that they want and that they need. Now, we believe that everyone has this fundamental right to decide whether or when they have children for just basic human dignity reasons, um, but also other important reasons like the ability to have some control over their economic security. And HB 110 is a huge step in making sure that this happens. I was so excited to be able to testify in support of this bill when it was in committee and was thrilled to see it get voted out of committee. So we're still waiting for it to get to the, the House floor for a vote. Um, but its next sort of step was uh, the Joint Finance Committee. They met this week, sent a letter to them being like, this is why HB 110 is so important um, and why it needs to get funded. And unfortunately, they have ended their markup session for right now without giving it the funding that it needs. But we are not giving up this fight. This is crucial to our work, um, crucial to the people here in Delaware. And so we are gonna keep fighting throughout the rest of this legislative session until June 30th. Um, but it's not something that I can do alone or even the ACLU of Delaware can do alone. Um, we need everyone who's on this call. We need your help right now. We need to make sure that our communities are mobilized, that our representatives hear that people are demanding the funding and the passage of HB 110. One of the easiest ways that you can start taking action um, is taking the action alert that was just dropped into the chat um, so that your representatives can hear this moment, this minute, um, that you want to see action happen on this bill and you don't want to have people wait another year before they can get the medical care that they need. So that's just a little bit of what we've been working on this year, but we've got plenty of other great things going on as well. Um, and Mike, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, you know, it, it really does uplift me when there's so much bad news across the country around reproductive rights that we, again, can move the ball forward here in the state of Delaware. We just need to, you know, continue to organize and build the political will to, to do so. So thank you for doing the work that you're doing. Um, so next up, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about expanding the staff. Um, we're going to hear from uh, two folks, uh, one who is also another recent hire of ours, uh, Hassani Perkins, who is our uh, racial justice community organizer, and he's actually shared uh, with us and uh, the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League and the Delaware Working Families Party. Uh, it's a collaborative program uh, where we uh, brought Hassani on in order to really organize in uh, uh, communities of color, particularly around housing issues. Um, you're also going to hear from Cheyenne Miller, who uh, doesn't work for the ACLU, but I feel like she does because we talk to her so much and she is often in our office uh, uh, strategizing and planning um, around housing issues. So Cheyenne, you're, you're like a work cousin for uh, us, but uh, they're going to tell you a bit about the uh, really, really impactful work uh, we've been doing around right to representation and evictions and how we are just nearly at the finish line uh, on this really important issue. So uh, Hassani, Cheyenne, I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that very much. And um, it has truly been an opportunity and a pleasure to work with ACLU and uh, for the rights for uh, representation, uh, the tenants. 
Um, I didn't never know that this was going to take a turn like this when we got up and was able to do public comment. And we was able to really see how moving this is, how important this bill is for people to be able to say something that is very secret, I mean, very sacred to their hearts, which is our home. That is one of our biggest things that we, whether we rent or whether we own, is one of our biggest assets. But the, one of the things that I wanted to point out in the bill, because we all are well versed in this bill, as Mike said, we've been fighting for this for almost three years now. So one of the things that I wanted to point out was the creation of the eviction uh, diversion program, which is designed to help resolve the payment or other issues while in the eviction court. And what does this do? It goes a little deeper than that. It sets up a conversation, <clears throat> something that is usually not happening between a tenant and a landlord when they reach this point. But it gives that opportunity to establish that conversation, to get some groundwork done and to, to maybe resolve an issue that could have been resolved way before. And I think that is very important because I don't want anyone to think in this bill, especially the landlords, to think that this is an attack. This isn't an attack. This is just an opportunity for those who are having a little bit of a little bit of trouble to be able to fight for their homes and also be directed through that fight with somebody that has a lot more information for them. And so with the person that I look up to one as the most, my mentor, so I would like to turn it over to Cheyenne Miller. Thanks, Hassani. Um, yeah, so I am like a work cousin. That's funny. <laughs> he said I'm a work cousin. <laughs> I like that, y'all. I like I'm a work cousin. Um, yeah, we've been working on right to representation for a really long time. And um, I think one of the things that Hassani covered really is about having renters get a, a chance to be essentially on a playing field, a level, play, level playing field that they're able to kind of focus on I'm getting yelled at by my kid. Um, that they're able to focus on being able to express what they need when it comes to mediation and hopefully be able to have a good dialogue with their landlord. And really, like, I feel like that gets to the core of what we are focused on in, in a lot of our work when it comes to housing is how do we help renters get to that space where they're comfortable not only speaking up for their own situation and their own self, but they're also comfortable speaking up for their neighbors, they're comfortable speaking up for their community, and they're comfortable speaking up to the people who have a lot of power. And so one of the things I get excited about is that a lot of our advocacy work isn't just us going and saying, hey, man, state legislator, do the right thing. Like, we actually ask renters to come with us and we teach renters about the process. And, you know, we encourage renters to be the ones that are out front. Um you know, fighting for their rights, fighting for their community. And I think that is something that really just speaks to a lot of advocacy work starting to look more grassroots, advocacy start work starting to look more um, about the community speaking up for itself and a lot more self-sufficient. And it, I think it speaks to us kind of moving towards what I call like renter solidarity and solidarity with the community where it's less about, you know, for us and more about by us, right? <laughs> Um, we do it ourselves. So I appreciate the opportunity to work together. I love working with Hassani. I love working with ACLU. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and share in this moment. Thanks, Cheyenne and Hassani. And I just want to say just a little bit more about uh, SB1, because, you know, this has been a, a really long slog. You know, we started this right after COVID started. And, um, you know, we uh, fought for the previous bill over two years in the legislative session. Um, eventually, on July 1st, in the wee hours of the morning, the bill got voted down uh, on the House floor. Uh, we didn't get enough uh, votes for it to be able to pass. Um, and it was a, a really, you know, crushing defeat. Uh, we had uh, fought for the bill for two years, and we had to kind of get back together as a coalition and say, okay, where do we go from here after we lost on the House floor? And, you know, in the um, ACLU, we don't give up, we double down. And so we said, okay, if we uh, weren't successful this go round, what do we need in the next go round to make sure that we are going to be successful? And the thing that we knew that we needed was that grassroots presence to have the folks who were closest to the pain be able to come into Dover and advocate for the solution. And so I just, I really 
um, appreciate the work that Hassani and Cheyenne have done to uh, organize these renters. And um, if you watched any of the testimony in the Senate or the House during committee hearings, you saw we had a great presence of folks um, uh, at those hearings and that legislators were hearing directly from those who were uh, impacted by um, uh, housing shortages and housing injustice. So thank you, Cheyenne and Hassani. And now we're closer than ever. It passed bipartisanly in the Senate. We are just one House vote and a governor's signature away from right to representation being a reality here in the state. So thank you all. Uh, and speaking of, you know, having that people powered uh, campaign, uh, next you're going to be hearing a bit from our folks who work on our smart justice campaign. Uh, so we have Hanif Salam, who is our smart justice campaign manager, and Timeless Thomas, who is one of our smart justice ambassadors. They have been doing some um, amazing work on a range of uh, criminal reform issues. Uh, they're going to speak uh, specifically about probation reform um, and some of the really, really exciting things that are happening down in Dover right now around that work. So, uh, Timeless, Sanif, I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thanks, Mike, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you on this evening. As stated, my name is Hanif Salam, and I'm the Smart Justice Campaign Manager and probation reform has been our top priority this year and will be going into the next year. I've had the honor of working hand in hand with Senator Marie Pinckney and her drafting and introducing SB4, which will customize probation and modernize Delaware's probation system. Uh, for people who don't know, Delaware is one of the most incarcerated states on the East Coast with higher incarceration rates per capita than New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Maryland, and many other states across the Eastern Seaboard. And the main factor to Delaware's high incarceration rates is the revolving door of its probation system. Probation was designed to be an opportunity to help an individual transition back into society, but it has turned into a revolving door of individuals recidivating and being reincarcerated, oftentimes for technical violations, for like missing a curfew, giving a dirty urine screen, or failing to complete a program that may not even be related to the charges that they have been convicted of. And I would not be able to do this work without the help of the Smart Justice Ambassadors. The Smart Justice Ambassadors is a new program uh, that we implemented within the ACLU over the past two years. And we identify individuals that have been impacted uh, by the justice system, people who have lived experiences, and we train them to be advocates and organizers. And Thomas Thomas is one of those individuals, and he's going to talk a little bit more about his experiences with the ACLU in Delaware and the SJA. <clears throat> yeah, how's everybody doing? Uh, thanks for having me. It's Thomas Thomas here. Of course, I came in uh, the ACLU, the Smart Justice Program under the mentorship and tutelage of Hanif Salam, and uh, before entering, I really didn't know too much about uh, any, I, I really didn't know that I had a voice that was significant. And so he provided us with the training to give us the platform and the opportunity to not only have our voice be heard, but to learn how to connect with the legislators, how to directly impact decision-making and legislation, uh, how to mobilize. He trained us on so much relevant uh, things uh, in 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 respects in he trained us to so much relevant stuff as it pertains to revolutionizing not just the probationary system but a lot of the injustices that that go on in the community on a daily basis and 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 I came in and and got really interested because I am the lived experience I'm the poster boy for the lived experience of injustice or uh, oh, oh, yeah. So uh, I've worked, I've partnered with uh, Senator Pinckney. I've done uh, work uh, with and under uh, Ms. Javon Rich. Uh, I've, I've participated and, and organized partially uh, a correction summit that was very, very relevant 
And uh, I, I appreciate the opportunities that, that I've had with the platform of becoming a smart justice ambassador, keyword being smart, to learn how to make uh, some noise that's intelligent and relevant. And, and that's pretty much all I have to say. And, I, and I've, 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 I really look forward to the future of contributing to revolutionizing a system that is definitely Flintstone. We definitely got to turn it back, you know, turn it into a Jetson system and get and get things going so we can be current and meet people where they are. That's one problem that I see the cultural humility that doesn't exist. There's a lot of old school educators trying to connect with with new school uh, uh, people. And it's a, it's a big disconnect. People have left. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a close because, you know, God, I can get less, but I'm a close with this. The old school, we, we just had, you know, mind, body, and soul. The new school has mind, body, soul, and digital. So when we're not meeting people where they are, uh, th th this is, I think that's uh, the communication barrier is why a lot of things aren't getting done. A lot of promises get made, but things don't get done because there really is a breakdown in communication. So I appreciate everybody trying to revolutionize the system, and I'm with you, and thank you. Thanks, Timeless and Hanif. Uh, uh, and I'm going to use, uh, we got to go from the Flintstones to the Jet Jetsons. I like that. Uh, but, you know, we have, again, so much amazing work happening around uh, our Smart Justice campaign. Um, if you are able, uh, you'll see on our website, on our calendar, uh, we actually have a uh, Smart Justice Lobby Day coming up on June 6, where we're going to be, again, talking to legislators, bringing our Smart Justice ambassadors along to speak directly to those folks who are in power, uh, advocating for uh, SB4, uh, which, again, would totally transform our probation system and end that revolving door between uh, prison and being on probation. And so again, such an important uh, uh, thing for uh, uh, we as Delawareans to go to the halls of power and legislative hall and advocate for. Um, one of the other uh, campaigns that whenever I get to talk about and, and hear this person talk, uh, I get excited is our education equity work. And uh, you're gonna hear from Shannon Griffin who is our senior policy advocate. And uh, Shannon is officially uh, uh, the uh, OG on staff now, I believe. So this is her 10th year at the ACLU of Delaware. And Shannon has done some um, amazing work around education equity, really bringing the uh, uh, parent uh, and student voice into education work and uh, focusing on alternatives to discipline, uh, raising the uh, standard for academics, um, and just, again, doing some really, really terrific community organizing. Um, I love that we work on this issue here at the ACLU of Delaware. Not every ACLU works on education issues, but, you know, if we are really looking at what impacts our communities, it all starts with education. So I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to talk a little bit more about the amazing work that she's been doing over the past year. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share briefly tonight. Um, like Mike said, I am the OG um, of the staff. I have been on staff almost 10 years, but I've actually spent almost over 25 years advocating for families uh, by demanding fairness and full access to a quality education. And like most advocates, this is personal to me. So navigating three black children, two boys, one girl through the public education system has been a journey. Um, my eldest son, then only eight years old, stood on the top of the stairs of his elementary school in tears when I arrived to pick him up um, from school because he'd failed a mandatory state test and was told he, taste, he uh, faced repeating the third grade if he didn't pass the retake in the summer. And he said to me, Mom, I'm a failure. My husband and I refuse to allow a system to determine our child's worth and potential. And so my journey as an advocate began. I started a free after school program so the students like my son could receive additional support in math and reading. Uh, my children would go on to whether being called the N word more than once, denied placement in advanced classes more than once. <laughs> um, a suspension for terroristic threatening 
uh, for responding to a bully, just to name a few. All while I was being a parent volunteer, PTO president, and serving on numerous committees. So it's been refreshing for me to work with an organization that fights for the rights of students and their families. And this would not be possible without our board, donors, members, and the trust of the communities and families that we work with every day. We are witnessing attempts to roll back diversity and inclusion in programs and education, outright book bannings, and teaching the full history of our country. And we can't be complacent in thinking that it can't happen here. In Delaware, achievement gaps persist and in some cases are worsening. Black boys and girls are being suspended two, at the rate of two or three times the rates of their white peers for committing the same offenses. And while we know and understand many educators and administrators across our state are working tirelessly to educate our children, the recent pandemic has laid bare that our system of education needs an overhaul. And the ACLU is committed to working with educators, parents, students, community members, and legislators to not just level the education playing field, but demand all children have access to a quality education. Uh, we just completed two, a two-year initiative at the Charter School in Newcastle designed to support schools deep in restorative practices, mobilize parents, elevate and elevate the student voice. Um, our, our partner, Occupin, who is a local expert in restorative practices and social emotional learning, has conducted training sessions throughout the year. Uh, we also established a parent advisory committee. And some of the topics that we discussed were how to be an effective advocate, understanding the special education process, how to support student learning at home, and the essential questions that every parent should ask during parent teacher conferences. And just as important, we help to connect them to their state legislators to advocate for equitable funding. The third and important component of the work involved engaging students through an after school program, Scholars Engage for Action. Uh, this is a service-based program that provides an opportunity for fourth through eighth grade students identify an issue that matters to them in their school or community. And students identify homelessness, combating negative social media challenges and bullying. And they were able to raise over $8,000 for their projects and have launched a student council to keep civic engagement going for future CSNC students. Uh, moving forward, I'm happy to announce that in, in the fall, we'll launch an education equity ambassadors initiative, similar to our SDA program, uh, that will mobilize, train and support families of students attending schools and the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. If you're interested, and learning more about our education equity, equity work, uh, you can complete or partnering with us, you can visit our website or you can email me directly at sgriffin at aclu-de.org. Thank you again for your time. Mike. Thanks, Shannon. And yeah, I'm so excited about these education equity ambassadors um, who are really going to be focusing, particularly in the Wilmington schools and the Wilmington Learning Collaborative, which you know, I think is a potentially once in a generation opportunity to really impact the uh, education uh, in our city schools. Um, you know, there are a lot of great duos out there in the world. Uh, and one of them is uh, Shannon Griffin and Melva Ware, who are uh, great partners uh, on our education equity work. Uh, Melva is uh, an amazing advocate in her own right and an academic uh, at University of Delaware. Uh, and Shannon and Melva have worked very closely um, over many years, but most recently at this uh, pilot program at the Charter School of Newcastle. Um, Melva is also a longtime supporter of the ACLU of Delaware. Uh, she is actually at a conference uh, tonight, uh, I, I believe on education issues, uh, but Melva uh, I recorded a few uh, thoughts for us uh, that we'll play uh, now. So I'll turn it over to that video of Melvin. Good evening. I certainly celebrate our education equity and safe schools work. 
and the foundation that it provides in Delaware's efforts to address the continuing disparity in educational opportunities available to far too many students. This disparity is certainly evidenced by the proportionately higher in-school and out-of-school suspension rates for black and brown students, particularly students with special learning needs, as highlighted in the spring 2023 National ACLU magazine. This is, of course, a national issue. ACLU Delaware provides leadership on this issue. We should applaud Mike and Shannon and the entire staff for recognizing that our success in 2018 in securing legislative action that amended Title 14 of the Delaware Code that regulates school discipline was a necessary first step in our contemporary work to establish inclusive, equitable policies and associated practices in Delaware schools. This is as a specific response to separate, excluded, and unequal realities. Delaware ACLU has gone further by taking a second significant step in working with experts to publish training modules that support school communities in adopting approaches to school discipline that build inclusive school culture. We are advocates for restorative discipline practices that encourage problem solving and result in students taking more responsibility for their own behavior. As you know, our Fair Discipline Toolkit is available on the Delaware ACLU website and accessible to all. In 2021, we took a third and crucial step in moving this work forward. Our partnership with the Charter School of Newcastle allows us to share a case study of a school community that has positioned problem solving and student responsibility as core values in fostering a productive learning environment. The school's leadership and instructional teams have created daily practices that convey ownership of behavioral and academic achievement standards that include all students. Exclusionary, zero tolerance discipline practices that result in high rates of in school and out of school suspension have been replaced by conversations and activities that build a sense of community. We are excited about sharing this case study and look forward to the upcoming publication of our video documentation. Forward we go. Thank you so much. And yeah, as Melva sort of alluded to at the end there, um, we actually are going to be having a series of videos coming out that is going to show uh, the work that we did at the Charter School of Newcastle, some of the changes that have happened uh, in that school and here you know, first person testimonials from some of the parents, students and uh, educators there at that school. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But again, really impactful work and just goes to show that, you know, we have a great staff member in Shannon. We have uh, a wonderful uh, volunteer and, and, and donor in Melva. And it's sort of a now trio because we also have uh, Melva's other half, uh, Leland, where with us here tonight, who's also been a longtime supporter of the ACLU. Uh, he's also an academic and, and expert and advocate in his own right as well. And so Leland, I, I wanna thank you for being here tonight because I always like to hear from folks who support the ACLU just a little bit about why why do you uh, choose the ACLU? What about our work uh, motivates you and makes you want to support our organization? Oh, and Leland, you're on mute, just so you know. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, sorry about that. 
Uh, I'm delighted to uh, be here this evening and to participate in this uh, panel. Uh, my uh, work with ACLU goes back quite a ways, almost 30 years, when I was on the board of the St. Louis um, ACLU. And from there, I served on the national board of the ACLU for probably a dozen years and uh, came here to Delaware and served on the local ACLU board. Uh, so uh, my work with and support for the ACLU is longstanding. My reason for supporting the ACLU is because of its activist background, you know, and supporting the uh, rights of individuals and has been done so for at least what 75 years now and so it is uh, probably the leading organization uh in this fight so i fully uh support it the school work is important and i'm delighted to see the aclu undertake more social justice in a visible and active way when i started back years ago it was more of a first amendment kind of a speech organization but lately has stepped out into the community and uh, engaged in this ongoing work, which is very important. And in particular, the uh, student work because of the uh, disciplinary issues that are disproportionately affect black and brown students. Uh, the Christina School District here locally was cited just a few years ago for uh, uh, di over disciplining uh, black and brown students. and. Uh, then the ACO, I'm sorry, the Department of Education conducted a national organization, a national study and found the same thing uh, across America. Uh, the students, black and brown students are disciplined and expelled and in other ways uh, treated unfairly for engaging in the same conduct uh, in which white students engage and are not uh, disciplined. So it's very important that people know this and that this work uh, go on and that they be made uh, aware of it. So it's a great, a great project and I'm looking forward uh, to working with you guys on this. Thank you so much, Leland. And uh, again, I feel so privileged to uh, be able to witness the great work that Shannon and Melva and the rest of our education equity folks uh, are able to do. And again, that's really only made possible because we have donors like Leland and Melva uh, and all of you who are watching who continue to support us and allow us to you know, double down when the stakes are, are high, uh, to be able to expand our staff, to be able to take risks uh, and be that organization out there pushing for more and pushing for our state to be better. So again, thank you all. And, uh, you know, we're also really only able to do this work, not just because of our terrific staff, but because we have an amazing board who has our backs, who uh, has uh, been at the table strategizing and helping to uh, ensure that we are a strong and well-run organization. Um, I am really excited because we have a new incoming board president uh, Ariel, Ariel Gruswitz, who uh, embodies all of the things that you would want in a board president. She is extremely supportive of all of the staff and all the work that we do. Um, she is always getting me to think of things that maybe I hadn't thought of myself, and she's willing to give of her time um, that she has uh, volunteered with us on uh, some research and legal things, uh, helped to table tab uh, do tabling events in the past uh, as well. Anything that we need, Ariel's uh, uh, willing to do. And so I'm so excited that she's going to be joining us as our new president. And she's going to be talking a little bit about what she's thinking about for the future, but also uh, going through um, some of our uh, departing board members and some of our incoming board members. So I'll turn it over to Ariel. Great. Thank you, Mike. My name is Ariel Gresswitz, and I'm honored to have been elected president of the Delaware ACLU. As Mike said, there's still so much work to be done, and we cannot be complacent. And before I go through some of the um, changes that are coming up on the board, um, I wanted to thank our outgoing president, Kathy Epler. Kathy's been a member of the board since 2018 and 
leading up to when she became president, um, played a pivotal role in helping us recruit Mike Brickner to be our executive director. And Mike, in the last three years since I've become a board member, has really built such a strong staff, expanded the staff. And I'm just so proud of all of the different issues that you've been hearing um, about tonight and all of the work that the, the really important work that we are engaged in across the state on all of these issues. Um, on the board, Kathy has been active in the governance committee, the finance committee, strategic planning, and also very instrumental in our Candler event in recent years and helping to raise funds for ACLU Delaware. So um, I don't know, do we have the slides for the board changes up? All right, so we wanna thank our outgoing board members, Alan Garfield, Lena Herbert, Leland Kent, Mark Perpura, and Yair Robinson. And we wanna welcome our joining board members, um, one of whom is rejoining us on the board, Charito Calvachi Mateiko, and then new board members for the first time, Caitlin McAndrews, James Nolan, Jennifer Sue, and Sarah Hildebrand. And we're very excited to have you on board and look forward to working with you. Mike, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Ariel. Um, again, I think we are so excited about uh, our new members. Um, they represent, um, you know, many uh, years of experience uh, in advocacy and academics and the law, um, who are going to just bring a wealth of uh, knowledge and experience onto the board. Um, at the same time, of course, we're sad to uh, lose the members who are rotating off, but uh, when I first joined the ACLU uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, uh, the executive director at the time would always say to anyone who was, you know, resigning or rotating off uh, that no one ever leaves the ACLU. And so we absolutely mean that for um, our uh, board members who are rotating off that uh, we know that you'll stay with us as uh, supporters and friends and allies because the fight for civil liberties it does not end, that there is always more work for us to do at the ACLU. Um, I also want to echo uh, the words that Ariel just gave for uh, Kathy Epler, who uh, again is our uh, uh, departing uh, president, but she's still going to be with us on the board as a regular board member and is going to be there to help advise everyone. Um, and, you know, there, there's so many things that I can say about Kathy. One that I'll just point out that those of you who are participants here are not going to be able to see, but those of us who are speakers can see is Kathy's been chatting all throughout this uh, 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 event. Every time a speaker ends, she's put in a kind word in the chat about what a great job that the person did speaking or how inspired she was about something that they said. And that's just exactly the kind of person that Kathy has been as the board president, that she's been one of our number one cheerleaders, um, always there for uh, encouragement, um, to provide some uh, thoughts or advice. Um, and, you know, we just really appreciate everything that Kathy has put in for the last three years. And again, she's not escaping us yet. She's staying on the board <laughs> uh, for at least another three years. Uh, and um, we are uh, just so happy that she, um, you know, stepped up into this role. I can tell you with COVID hitting, a new executive director coming in, um, this was not an easy job. And Kathy tackled it with uh, a plum and, uh, and a lot of hard work and just did a, a wonderful, wonderful job. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy to give us our final words of the evening. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you so much, Mike. That was, um, I'm blushing, really blushing. Um, it's always been um, a love of mine um, to fight for civil liberties. And I've been doing that um, for a very, very, very long time. Um, so, um, it's been my privilege and my pleasure to work with our outstanding board and staff 
and and as Mike said, I'll be with the board a little bit um, longer. Um, and even when I'm off the board, just like um, our participants tonight, I will be an active supporter of the ACLU. I want to thank our participants for all your attention and support. And um, although we've covered a lot tonight, there's always more to do. Um, again, as many of our um, people have said, please visit our website, aclu.de.org, to keep up to date with our work. And um, use the links to contact your legislators on current issues. Um, they um, are there so uh, your voice is heard. Make sure that, you know, if something tonight sparked your interest, just dash off an email to one of our legislators. Um, we live in challenging times, and it's up to all of us to prevent the erosion of our rights. The Delaware ACLU cannot do it without your support. Um, and thank you all so much tonight. Um, with that, uh, the ACLU annual meeting of 2023 is now adjourned. Good night, everybody.